Hi, everybody. Recruiting Animal here on uh, September 7th, uh, 2022. Uh, I've got a lot of competition today. This is apparently a Talent Acquisition International Celebration Day, and uh, there's all day classes for free on LinkedIn. So all of the masses of people who would normally uh, log into the Recruiting Animal show, they're over there. But there <laughs> There's only one report I've had, and it was very good. It was from Glenn Guttmacher, a friend of the show. He made a presentation, and, and, and there was some technical problem. It wasn't recorded. And, and I have to say, it made me feel good. I'm not the only one. I'm not the only one who's got problems. It I, I reminded me of, uh, I, was, I don't like being the guest on other people's shows, but you know, people bug me, I will. So I was a guest on a show that had two hosts, right? And they post all the recordings on uh, YouTube, but they didn't post. They didn't post mine, and they said, "Oh, we had a problem with that recording." But I think the problem was not me. It was one of the guests. I don't know because maybe because I was the guest, one of the hosts rather. He was talking about how he shaves. <laughs> He shaves his genitals. I don't know. <laughs> I didn't mind. <laughs> All kinds of wild stuff on a show about recruiting. I won't say what show it was, but that's uh, what happened. We've got a, an auditor. You know, uh, when I was uh, in university, sometimes we audited uh, classes. We didn't sign up. We just went and listened to the lecture. Well, we've got the great uh, Trisha Tampkin. Okay. She's uh, said hi. She's uh, wearing... Uh, She's wearing clothes that she doesn't, she doesn't want to show in public. So she's not going to show her face. She's one of these disembodied voices. But I told her whenever she wants to chime in, that's fine with me. OK, so I don't know who else is going to join. I was just telling her I've never been uh, done a whole show uh, on my own, but uh, we'll start it. Let's see what else. Oh, you know what? I was going to ask. I'll ask Trisha, but you can say, Trisha, you don't want to talk about it, okay? Somebody was going on about which email warm-up tool is uh, the best, and it sounded like something that I should know about, but I don't really. Do you know about email warm-up tools? Uh, I don't know a lot about the different tools, um, but I can barely can. hear you. Is that me or you? I think it might be you. Okay, of course. They, they always blame the other guy. Go ahead. <laughs> so I, I, can't it up. Speak to, I can't speak to any of the specific tools, but what I can speak to is the fact that recruiters in general don't understand how important email deliverability reputations are. Critically important. So when we're... If we're sending any email out through our ATS or we're sending it out through like a MailChimp or AWeber or one of those providers, we have to warm up the email address and they call it a ramp, like you have to send 10 and then 20 and then 30 and then 40 over the course of many, many days uh, in order to establish your sending reputation. So if we don't with warm Google, up- With Google, with who? Um, with, with Google? The, it is actually, it's a very weird thing, Animal. What happens is the internet as a whole keeps track of your email. So you can go to senderscore.org and put in your domain, put in your email address, and it'll tell you what your sending score is. And so if you would like, I can send you an email with that link and a blacklist checker, uh, which would give you the indication that, you know, your sending is not highly regarded. Oh, okay. And so the, the, this guy, he's got two tools he was talking about. You, uh, I think one is called uh, Warm Up Inbox, Warm Up Inbox, and the other is Lem Warm, L-E-M warm and they they take care of uh, uh sequencing your initial warm-up what you called your your ramp up you know what i didn't introduce trisha uh she is a famous recruiting trainer but also a hands-on recruiter uh she she's uh i think rich rosen's one of his favorite trainers he's always he's always <laughs> praising you on the show but tell us your website uh if uh if somebody wants to go and check you out trisha yeah, it's More Essentials, M-O-O-R-E, Essentials, okay. More Essentials. So thanks, Animal, I appreciate it. Okay, fine.
Okay, what about this? I saw somebody say that, you know, recruiters who, you know, there was a big, uh, a huge demand for recruiters not long ago, right? And they were being offered big money. And uh, now lots of people are being laid off you know, just a few months later. And so someone posted and he said that those recruiters who jumped ship and took new jobs for more money, they're stupid. They That's a good sign that they're not good recruiters. And I'm going to tell you why. Because a good recruiter's got the experience to know that the economy goes up and down. When something like that happens, it's like, you know, Newton's apple. <laughs> what goes up must come down, right? So they had no insight where they should have. They can't advise people about the market if they were so stupid to be suckered in by a... Uh, a, a short, what was obviously going to be just a, a short bump. What do you think, Tricia? Are they, is that a sign? Don't hire those guys. They are dumbbells. No, heck no. I mean, a recruiter, come on, animal. A recruiter should always be open to looking at new opportunities. Wouldn't that be ridiculously hypocritical to not explore another opportunity? And if they got a bigger salary because the demand was there, I don't, and then they got laid off because the demand went away. We could argue that they didn't necessarily make a great choice, but I wouldn't eliminate them from canvassy because of that. Well, look at this. We got two consultants, two famous trainers on today. Here's Gavin Johnson. Trisha, Trisha Tampkin is disembodied. I don't know if you guys are aware of each other, but Gavin's been on before. Now Trisha's on for the first time. What a, what a, what a great show already. I am excited, okay? But Trisha, I disagree with you. I think the people, I think this guy had a point. Uh, anybody could see if uh, this, after COVID, there was all, all of us, you know, if everybody got furloughed or laid off for COVID, all of a sudden there was a huge demand. It seemed bizarre. I think it was suspicious from the start. Gavin Johnson, do you know what the question I'm talking to Trisha is? Did you hear it? Nope. Well, I can't hear this guy now. Talk into your microphone, will you? Yeah, okay. Look, uh, can you hear me? <laughs> Nod your head. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And you don't hear me. Okay. Well, I can, but uh, Tricia, is it my fault again? Can you hear him? I can hear him just fine. I think it's all you. <laughs> yeah, it's always me. It's always me. Always a Canadian guy. Okay, look. Uh, Gavin, these people, you know, there was a, a, all kinds of recruiters were laid off during the, the initial COVID stages. Then all of a sudden, there was a huge demand for recruiters. This guy said that recruiters who bit, who took a lot more money, they jumped their, left their jobs, took a lot of money, and then got, now they're getting laid off. He said they were suckers. They should have seen it was a worm on a hook, you know, uh, because they should know that the economy doesn't work like that. It was a sudden burst that was going to crash. What do you think? Trisha, I'll tell you, I'll warn you. Trisha says that I'm wrong. They did the right thing. It's just the way things worked out. What do you say? Oh, so it's not limited to just recruiters. There's many people that were in the same situation. He's not um, answering the question. Yeah, okay. It is. it is because it's a much larger thing than just recruiters. Um, and, and for me, you've got to take the opportunities where they're there. And you mustn't come crying afterwards if you could profit for a, a certain period of time. Okay, I won't. I won't. Yeah, I won't uh, fight with that one, Trisha. I'm going to uh, skip right forward to uh, and Gavin to a question, and uh, that I was going to wait for uh, Rich to answer uh, because he wrote a he wrote a, a long comment. But I'm going to I'm going to do it now. Okay. Here's what Rich says. I'm going to read it. It's a bit long. Rich, he says, recruiting is a sales job. If you are working on an unexciting search, you still need to present it with excitement. Just telling the facts is not recruiting. Find, you have to find out the sizzle of your client, get people excited, get them to take a chance, to be open to an opportunity. That's recruiting. Okay. Now, he goes on to give an example, okay, that's, uh, which is what I like. He says, I just placed a sales rep with a client who was selling the most boring solution, upgrades of PeopleSoft to higher educational institutions. It's a dead software package, 
and totally boring. But I loved, he says, the VP. We built great rapport. Uh, we found the sizzle, which was the company's strength in PeopleSoft engineering and its track record. Sorry to go on so long, just a bit more. He said, I spent a couple of days on it and realized it was worse than I thought. So I worked with the client to change the profile from young kids to older experienced guys that had sold PeopleSoft in the past. The new pitch was that this would be a great last ride into the sunset for these people. And that's what they hired. It was a great win for a boring company. Now, I believe that Rich pulled <laughs> the second part of this story, just pulls the rug out from what he said initially. It had nothing to do his success there with uh, you know presenting it in an exciting way because nobody bit. What made the difference were two things. He had the insight as to what they needed. So he gave them not just recruiting, but consulting services. And the VP was smart enough to trust him and go with it. Trisha, you first, what do you think? Am I right or is Rich totally correct in this? Well, I mean, I think you're both right. Okay, so it, Rich did a wonderful thing there. What he said in the first part of his comment, like, we are salespeople. Recruiters are salespeople. If you don't think you're a salespeople or a salesperson, you're probably not a good recruiter. So I completely agree with that uh, perspective from Rich. Now, the second part of it, what he did was recognize that he had to change the avatar of the candidate in order to make the story compelling. So he made the story compelling by changing the avatar of the candidate. And I, I think that's still very much a sales function. You know, I understand what she means by changing the avatar. She meant the profile of the target candidate, the ideal profile. Okay, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Some kind of jargon. She doesn't want you to get the secrets, okay? So she's using those magic words. Okay, <laughs> okay, yeah. But so what you so what what the thing that you're saying though is implicitly without saying it selling getting people excited you know is not enough it's got to have ah it's got to have substance for them and I think that was the killer there Gavin what do you say actually I completely agree with Trisha but I've got a question and the question is did Rich already know which candidate he was going to be able to propose to this client at the moment he was talking to the client, because that's also part of the whole game. You're switching, knowing exactly what you're gonna be able to feed in, and you make your own job much easier that way. Okay, uh, I Gavin- I totally case, agree. Well, Gavin believes I, that what the thing, he, he believes that having a narrow niche, correct me, right here to correct me, everybody says I represent them incorrectly, including Rich, okay? Uh, so, he believes in having a narrow niche that allows you to know everybody working in the market. So he would know in advance who was available. But what I gather from Rich is that, no, he talked to a bunch of uh, the original targets, maybe 10 or 20, I don't know. It didn't work out. And so he went back with a, a new idea without anybody in hand. That's, that's my guess. Okay. So so, but here's the point. There's lots of people who say, we're not salespeople. All we do is deliver information. Okay. And Rich is saying, no, that's not true. What I do is make it sound exciting. Okay. And I, I, I he's a, he's a good talker. I always find he's energetic. He doesn't have to put it on, but he says he makes sure he sounds energetic on the phone. And that, it seems to me, his idea about the essence of selling. Are, are, uh, Trisha, are you on board with that? When you say we're salespeople, it's just sounding like a, a fun, making everything sound fun, like you're a camp counselor? Oh my God, no. I mean, that's not what sales is. Sales is influence. It's persuasion. It is telling a compelling story after you understand what's going to be compelling to the candidate. It's not about enthusiasm. Uh, enthusiasm, I know some stellar, stellar salespeople that I would never classify as enthusiastic. They're compelling and persuasive. So no, enthusiasm does not equate to sales. And so a anybody, cold fish, uh, 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 a cold fish could be a good recruiter. You're saying that implicitly, am I right? 
you're wrong. I am not saying that implicitly. Well, didn't I am she just that say you don't have to be? No, you don't have to be enthusiastic, <laughs> Kevin. Didn't she just say that? No, you're, you're both right, though. You can. The thing is this: if you bring something to an audience that is not interested, whatever way you bring it, it's going to not work. But if you bring something, even in a cold way, to an audience that is interested, and if you've got the right data behind it, you don't have to be, wow, an amazing and, and fantastic speaker, you will manage to do it also. The trick is, know your audience. Okay, so Trisha says sales, you see, <laughs> here's something else, okay? She said, really what it is, is qualifying the prospect. So you get somebody on the phone, a candidate, and you ask a lot of questions, and then you just match up your job with the uh, with with what the candidate uh, has told you. Uh, am I right? Am I representing you correctly, Tricia? Isn't that what um, you said? No, let me let me add a little bit of color to that. Okay, like you know the old adage where they say, "Sell me a pen," right? Here, sell me this pen. Like I can't sell you a pen if I don't know what in the world you're going to use the pen for, right? So. When we go into a recruiting call with a candidate, the very first thing that we do is try to determine from them what the next step in their career looks like, okay? Michael, I will say to them, we are going to have the single most important part of any conversation we're ever going to have right now. I want to know what you want. What does it look like? And then I take copious notes. I don't interrupt them. I let them tell me exactly what they want. And then when I present the opportunity, I present it in the exact order that they told me of what they wanted because often it, it is given to you in order of priority, barring maybe compensation. So well, well, I Let me just know. stop you for a second. I got to point something out. That, that first line... I felt it. I'm gonna. What? 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 What did you say? I'm gonna tell you the most important thing that we're Animal, ever gonna tell right you. Right now, here. Here's what we're gonna do. You and I are going to have the most important part of any conversation we are ever going to have, and that's how we're gonna start. Okay. I you know what? Know. I just want to say something. I just find that a little more seductive and mysterious. When Trisha says it, then I think it, I would if Gavin Gavin said it to me. <laughs> I'm sorry. All right, come on, Gavin. Come on, Gavin. Do my script. Let me hear it. Come on, you I can would, add the sultry. <laughs> I, I wouldn't dare do that. <laughs> I, I, I find that I find that I've never heard that before, and I find it very striking. Okay, so uh, you've got, I think you've got something there. She's a trainer. I, I don't, I, I always feel comfort, uncomfortable with trainers. I don't like them giving away too many secrets that they actually charge people for. But I think that's a, that's a nugget. Uh, you don't, you don't agree. I don't think you agree with it. You don't like it, Gavin, do you? Or would you say, no, he doesn't. Look at that. He's no, it's not that. Face. It's not that. It's actually very interesting because for me, I don't start about the future. I start about the present because I want to understand where they are now and what is, what is their motivation to move? What, is, what they, do they not like now? Because that's especially important later down the recruitment process where they're going to maybe have a counter offer or they're going to be hesitating about accepting an offer. Then you're going to go, yeah, but all this bit. Now, of course, what they want to have in the future, what motivates them is important, but I tend to work in a chronological way. Okay, well, I so think one of the, what, hold on a second, Animal. One of the things that's interesting here is we started this off talking about sales, right? Is recruiting sales? And so we can absolutely go in, Gavin, and ask them, you know, why, like, why are you, why did you accept this call? Why are you talking to me, right? We know I want to talk to you. Why do you want to talk to me? Like, I think that makes a whole lot of sense. But if I don't give the candidate an opportunity to express to me exactly what they're looking for, then how in the world can I sell them a pen? I can't sell it to them if I don't know what's important. So let, let's look at a hypothetical. You're on the phone with a candidate. What's the most important thing to you? What if that candidate says, I really want to get my MBA and education reimbursement is my number one priority? If I haven't asked that question, I have no idea how to present the opportunity in a way that's compelling to the candidate. Influence, persuasion, 
right? So we have to gather that information. And I am an extremely efficient recruiter. I start the conversation that way. Clearly, I have a job I've matched them to, or I wouldn't be on the phone with them. And if what they tell me doesn't match my job, what they want doesn't match what I have, what I say to them is, thank you so much, Gavin, for spending this time with me and helping me get an understanding of what you want for that next step. May I have your permission to interrupt you should I come across that opportunity? They always say yes, and the key here is now I'm off the phone with a candidate that doesn't fit. I don't need to learn about why they want to leave. I don't need to learn about their experience, their skills. I don't need to pre-close. I need to get off the phone and get on the phone with someone else. Okay, that's a, but let me, before I forget, okay, there's okay. two things I want to say. One is that if you're cold calling somebody, if you're a headhunter and you're looking for passive candidates and you say, what are you looking for? What do you want? Uh, they're going to say nothing. I'm happy where I am. Isn't that the classic? I'm not looking. Okay. So I want to, you, you, that's, I see that you know, they're not going to say, well, I want, I want a place that's going to pay for my tuition, my student loan. That's number one. Number two, Ernie uh, Marino, who's a regular on the show, he always says there's moving a, a fr away from something and there's moving towards something. Trisha seems to focus on the moving toward and Gavin says he focuses on the moving away. Would that be a, a fair statement? I do both. Okay, but you start off with moving away. You're frowning so much. I, every time I talk to you, I think you're saying, no, no, he, he's crazy. I don't like this. I'm not okay. frowning. No, no, at all. Yeah, you're frowning, frowning okay? Like he's frowning. <laughs> oh, oh, if I ask her, she's going to say, no, no, he's not frowning. You're crazy, okay? But, but Patricia, what about that? When you say, well, what would you say? You know, what, what would you be looking for in your next position? What if the person says, I'm not looking. I'm happy here. Well, typically, um, uh, it has taken somewhere in between 2 and 15 points of contact before I've gotten them on the phone. If I get them on the phone on a cold call, all I'm, my only purpose is to schedule an actual call with them. I think the idea of calling, cold calling someone, whether it's a client or a candidate, and somehow having the expectation that they're going to stop whatever they're doing to take your unexpected call and either let you interview them or let you do a requirements definition is absurd. It doesn't happen. That doesn't so, make any difference. Even if they agree, okay, call me tonight, you'll still say, say the same thing is going to come out, okay? I do. So, but if they say, call me tonight, they already know I'm a headhunter. So they're taking my call, right? Now when we get on the phone, I'm going to start with let's jump into the most important thing, right? So I've got them on the phone. They know I'm a headhunter because I've had to talk to them to explain that to them either electronically or verbally in order to schedule the call. Gavin, you want to say something? I think, I think the interesting thing here is, is it doesn't really matter how you get on the call. That What's important for me is to really understand what their needs are this is going back to the original question, huh? because then you're going to be able to sell to them better. MarioRecruiter.com, this is a you're fantastic course. show. Trisha Tampkin and I Gavin know, Johnson That's right, are both here. Yeah, it's terrific. Hey, guys. Okay, Gavin, hey, I interrupted you. Keep going. No, it's finished. To... I, think, I think that to, that to come back to your original question, are we selling? Yes. Does enthusiasm help? Yes, but you need to know your avatars, as Trisha says. That's it. Okay. Funny thing, I'll remember now, Trisha said a few minutes ago, uh, you know, like uh, my contention is that selling is persuasion. It, the, the other stuff too, but the key that, that when people think about selling, it's persuasion. And she mentioned persuasion, although we didn't get into it. Okay. She, what, what we talked about was actually matching just qualifying the, the customer, so to speak, and then matching your offering with uh, the things they've, they've told you. But if they say no, okay, uh, there's a famous book, the sale, sale begins when the customer says no. That's, that's, that's what I consider that it's handling the objections. Uh, and whenever I ask this question, I never get a good answer. I ask the recruiters on the show, did you ever persuade anybody to uh, take a job when they didn't want to take a job? And people will say, I don't persuade anybody. That's not my job. Anybody want to address that? 
Now I'm frowning. <laughs> <laughs> well, go I, ahead. I, I did that three weeks back and it just backfired me. Really you know, I can't hear this guy either. Am I wrong oh, again? Jesus. Yes, you're wrong, definitely. Okay. Oh, okay. Actually, yeah. you're, you're right. You guys are. <laughs> I didn't have it on my ear. <laughs> well, listen, I, I persuaded a guy to take a position and it backfired just one week back. Okay. He joined up and he resigned on the second day. Okay. Because you you kind of shoehorned him into the job. No, Is that... I didn't shoehorn him. He's a moron itself. Okay, he thought the role was for uh, healthcare, but it was an IT based project. Okay, we told him before then the guy is freaking nuts. All right, so no use of persuading anyone. I just want to say, get lost. Okay. I just I just want to give Trisha. I I don't know. You said you just wanted to take a look at the show. Uh, I just want to let you know you can leave. I mean, I'm not. I I just want to. Let you know. Are you kicking me out, animal? Are you I'm not me kicking you out. I want you to stay. I want you to stay. I'm having fun. You got me. He, 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 he will not do that. He's a very nice guy. Please stay on the show. We want you back as a guest again. Okay. 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 <laughs> okay. Uh, does anybody? So does anybody agree with me that persuasion is the key element of of sales? And is there a danger when you persuade someone to take a job when they say no to begin with? I can certainly address that for you. Um, I think first and foremost, yes, persuasion is sales. Yes, we're salespeople. Yes, we are involved in persuading and influencing people to explore opportunities, okay? I think it's critically important for recruiters to all fully, completely accept the fact that there is no script that you are going to use that is going to convince a candidate to take a job that they don't want and there is no script that you're going to use that's going to convince a hiring manager to hire someone they don't want. Okay, so we're going to influence and persuade at the early stage of the process to encourage the passive candidate to look at our opportunity. We can hold their hands and influence them throughout the process, but we are not capable of convincing someone to take a job they don't want or convincing someone to hire someone they don't want. We don't have control over the end of our process. Really? I mean, so if the hiring manager says, Tricia, I, I, I don't I don't think this candidate's for me, you won't say, are you crazy? You know how many people I spoke to and how lucky you are to get this guy? You won't do that. Is that what you're saying? That's what I'm saying. Okay, well. We yeah, disagree. I won't do that. When, um, when we try to push people into something that they truly don't want. We're not salespeople, we're bullies. And I'm not a bully. Okay, okay. so okay. Yeah. at the point, what, are you crazy? Do you know how many people I've talked to? This is ridiculous, you need to hire this person. If I talk to my clients like that, I, I wouldn't have my clients anymore. We're some, in a some, service business. Some people to need care. a talking to. Some people yeah. need a talking to, and they need to be scolded, okay? Because they are stu they're stupid. Now, the thing is, uh, which the story we told a few minutes ago, Rich went back to that client and persuaded them to do something different, completely different than they thought they were going to do, okay? So uh, I don't But it know. wasn't persuading them to hire someone they didn't want to hire. It was changing the scope of the job, which took persuasion and took influence and sales ability on Rich's part, but he didn't convince them to hire someone that they didn't want to hire. Oh, they were looking for young sales reps. Apparently they were ageist. And he said, hey, you are wrong. You know how many people I spoke to and wait to want a job like this because it's totally boring? What you need is some old guy who you know has no future and just wants to coast his way based on his past experience. That's essentially what he did, okay? <laughs> That's true. Okay. Gavin, you want to say something? No? I think it's interesting, actually, because you've got two levels. I think with a candidate, you can never, never, never go too far. Because at the end of the day, that's when mistakes start happening. And that's when you have miscasting. Plus, then you get a terrible reputation in your market. On the client side, I am willing to push much more. I'm willing to say no. And I'm willing to say to my client, this is the opportunity that you're going to miss if you do not take this person. That I'm willing to do. But big okay. Yeah, you know, typically in, that, in that situation, if, if I have a client that is misbehaving, right? If they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing, 
then I will go to the client and very nicely explain to them that as much as I enjoy representing them in the market, unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to continue to do so until they start behaving better. So I'll hand slap the client all day long with the, the legitimate threat of walking away. Like if that works, wonderful, because I don't want to support misbehaving clients. So they either need to get their act together or get out of my pipeline. Mm. Okay, that was the toughest she's got. Get out of my pipeline. She's a bit like a teacher. Jimmy, I want you to learn. I love having you in my class. But if you do that again, we're going to have to visit the principal. Okay, that's what it sounds like to me. That's, that's what it is. <laughs> okay. okay, okay. So okay. so I just want to clarify where we are. If if you send uh, the candidate out, both of you agreed on this and, and uh, Mario Kind of, I don't know. He, that if the candidate says, you know what, I've been out to three interviews. I don't think this is the job for me. Uh, you're never going to fight with them. You're never going to say, no. I think it is the job. No, if they show us one more interview, we'll push them for it. Why not? I'm not going to push Because your wording them. is it's such that you're going to be careful about this. You don't fight. You, you might try and persuade and bring yeah. arguments that come from them because you know them, you've asked all the questions and you align the, the arguments based on what they've told you in the beginning. That is quite yeah. different from going into a fight. You've got to, you've yeah. got to just pre be, you've got to be like a, a data presenter. You've got to have that most beautiful presenter that they can see, oh, well, maybe he or she is right. But you do not go and fight with them for something that, will never work in any case. But there's there's a fine line that you get with experience about how far you do push and when you're gonna learn, okay, I'm taking the, the foot off the throttle. There's one more thing I have noticed with people. The more effort they put into something, the more they're willing to stretch a little bit here and there. Now, let's say a guy has attended three interviews, okay? We can slightly, have you have a better chance of convincing him to attend one more? With the way we word it, okay? How we word it, they just wanna have a quick discussion with you or something? to finalize things and iron out the details before the but Mario the if the candidate no. says Mario if the candidate mm. says that they're not interested why wow. are we going to waste their time and more See, importantly true, our true. clients with Agreed. the candidate but, that's not take the job See the candidate has attended three interviews unless he has some justified reason to say I'm not interested okay or he just feels that they're wasting his time another 10 to 15 minute interview won't hurt him after that right if he is desperate to get the job or he wants to get the job. Well, but he's already he, told us he's not interested. So I'm not, okay. if a candidate tells me I'm not interested in moving forward, I'm going to respect that decision yeah. because I'm not the person that shows up and does the work. They are. I can't right. decide what the right opportunity is for them. Only they can decide that. Well, let me address. So, let me address hey. that for a sec. I'm with you guys in that. The thing is, I don't really un I understand uh, someone's career path, and I don't want to take responsibility for it. But if you're working a a, a, a niche for years and yeah. years, uh, will you really have the ability to say, you know what, uh, Betty, this is a great opportunity for you, and you're going to be making a mistake if you pass it up. Uh, is does anybody yeah. agree that that's a possibility? You I'm will do course. that. So oh, you yeah, will yeah. persuade. You will try to persuade. If she says no, I don't. Uh, uh, Betty, you're missing something here. Will you do that? Yeah, well, I'm again very very wary of of your usage of words, animal, because you were talking about yeah. fighting. Now you're talking about persuading. I will present the facts. If this is a good career move, I will say exactly why it's a good career move based on what she told me. And then it's up to her to decide. But I am going to try, of course, especially if it is really a good move for her. You've got to come up. You've got to present the arguments. And then it's up to the candidate to decide. So what you're saying is she already knows why it's a good move for her. I'm saying she doesn't. Because you're no, saying, no, I'm you're saying just, she doesn't. Oh, yeah, yeah. You're saying the normal thing. I asked her a bunch of questions at the beginning. Now I'm shoving them down her throat and saying this fits all that stuff. OK, so what basis do you have for rejecting it? No, no, you're that's what you're doing, isn't it? Am I'll I right? Example. I'll give you an example that I have all the time is so I, I place ERP specialists, Oracle specialists, and there's always new versions coming out. Now, I know more than them because I see many more companies. I see many more candidates. I know the market better than the candidates. 
And therefore, I can tell them. Yeah, I always put candidates on one side, clients. That's on the other okay side. with me. I like <laughs> hand. Mo- I like hand motions. And candidates first, of course. Um, and and so for me, I I'm better place to be able to say now is a time when you need to get on this kind of project to get that experience on your CV. Because there's always life cycles of of, uh, of versions. I'm better placed than most candidates to be able to do that because I've got the global view that they don't. Am I crazy? Is this the opposite of what he said <laughs> 10 minutes ago? I, mean, I feel like I'm in a different world than everybody here. Okay, this guy what persuades, okay? Trisha, is he overstepping according to you? I don't think so, no. I think what Gavin is saying is that there's a fine line when you're dealing with a candidate of pushing too hard. And he's using the information that he gathers from the candidate to uh, add to his own perspective on his industry that he feels very capable giving direction and advice. I I don't think that he's talking out of both sides of his mouth at all. Okay. You you. know, Rich said something else. I mentioned that uh, it was the fact that he consulted with them uh, that made the big difference. Okay, he told them, this is I checked the market. This is what you really need. This it's not working. That's one thing. But then he was smart enough to come up with a good idea about what's going to work. But the other thing he said was that it was he said, and this is a classic. This is the Rich Rosen rule. Okay, of the 10, 10 recruiting rules. He said, I don't work with clients I don't like. That's why he said yep. it was fun to have a, a good rapport with the VP. Okay, that made all the difference as well. Uh, I, I heard some enthusiasm there. You, he fires his clients. Do you? Oh my God, I have fired so many clients. I fire them often. Really? Oh, and what? Okay, Mario, she's going to tell us one story just to illustrate it. Then we'll come to you. You can tell us. Trisha, one second before you go to the story. Based on the point that you and Gavin agreed on, okay, from what I understand, you need to be pretty experienced in your niche to be able to make a move like that to convince a candidate or to maybe sell the candidate on their career path. I don't think that will apply to all the average recruiters that are around there. What do you think? Um, if I understood correctly, what you were asking is do you need to have experience? experience in your niche in order to advise. Too. Yes, to advise. The way Gavin was mentioning, he was able to advise a candidate on the career path side. Am I correct, Gavin? Or have I got yeah. it wrong? But that's because he has about 20 years of Oracle EBS experience. I'm sorry if it's wrong, but I'm sure some Oracle products. You're, you're right. Yeah. You're, you're saying okay. the right stuff. So yeah. with the 20 years of experience, he can predict what's going to happen. This may not apply to the average recruiters who have four to five or maybe 10 years of experience in multiple niches. I think four years is enough. You know the market. I do too. <laughs> okay, I think enough. one maybe of the things some more you can there. take, Mario, you can take a recruiter that has mm-hmm. never been a recruiter before, put them mm-hmm. on a desk, have them talk mm-hmm. to 30 people in one mm-hmm. niche every yeah. week for a year, and they're qualified. They're qualified oh, okay. to advise because they have a better perspective. Okay. You know, Ga- Gavin, we didn't, uh, what's your website? What's your website? We didn't say who you are, okay? Everythingaboutrecruitment.com. Oh, you know what? I raved about that last time, and here I forgot. I said, I'll never forget it, and I didn't for a long time, okay? <laughs> say it again. Trisha, please come here with stories. Just because I go on holiday, everythingaboutrecruitment.com. Moreessentials.com is, and yes. it's M-O-O-R-E, essentials.com. That's Trisha. Mario, the recruiter.com will take you to his diverse LinkedIn profile. Okay. Uh, okay. So is there anything, does anybody else want to talk about this? Anymore? Mario's point, I think it's important to, to realize that you've got, you work in levels when, when, you know, when you start in, in, in your, in your career as a recruiter, you're going to be developing a number of skills and the more time goes by, the more you're going to be able to bring added value to your market. So, I think after even two years, you can already start giving career advice if you've been doing the right thing. If you stay in a niche like I've stayed in the same niche, of course, it goes exponentially up. But it doesn't mean you can't be a good biller. It just means that as time goes by, being a top biller will become easier and easier. Okay, that makes total sense. Okay, there's a. I'm going to move on to another yeah. story. Uh, Anna, this, I'm I, interrupting. Trisha was going to tell us a story about she was going to fire her clients. 
Oh I'm yeah, good, good. Yeah, well, hold on. The rule on this show is anyone can interrupt anybody, okay. especially me. Let me, tell you, let me tell you a story, okay? It was right after I brought Jason, who's my husband, on to be a recruiter. And at that point, uh, we had been uh, cognizant technology solutions. Uh, when we first started supporting them, they were only a $400 million company. Now they're a multi-billion dollar company, but it was the perfect example of a cash cow, right? They had interview days scheduled three days a month. We were able to feed candidates into live interview days. We had a 50% offer ratio. We were doing seven figures with them. It was a phenomenal client. We kept that client for years, and as they got bigger and bigger, um, there was more and more red tape. Uh, we had circumstances where they were – They'd give us a job, we'd present candidates, and then they would put the job on hold. They'd give us another job, we'd present candidates, and now the job would disappear. It wouldn't even be put on hold. So Jason had come to me, he was only a recruiter for about three weeks at that point, and said, I'm extremely frustrated with this client, um, that they keep changing the requirements, it's my client. I called them, I talked to the head of TA, told him that from that point forward, we would not accept any other positions without a $10,000 retainer. So we had done multiple seven figures with that client, and as soon as the tides turned and they weren't able to continue at the pace that they were on, we fired them. Wow. Wow. So I'm, you know, I'm, I'm you blown questions. away. Yes. What? what? Uh, sorry to interrupt you, Trisha. Trisha, this is Cognizant Technology Solutions, right? That is correct. It's an Indian-based MNC, multinational corporation that opened up its offices in America, right? Yeah, right. they were based uh, in right. New Jersey. Yeah. Yes, yes, uh -huh. yes. Okay, 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 okay. Right. You know, there's actually a game run by a lot of these companies. Um, I don't know whether you guys know about it. How they use uh, recruiting firms to just get resumes. And then what they do is they take the resume, keep it in the database, and then they build, it, build up on their own databases by doing that. You see, they don't pay for um, the resume, right? They pay only for the placement. So now let's well, see. I mean, I made them, over 75 then, placements with them at an executive level. No, I mean, so they happens. weren't just populating their database. No, what, what, caused them, what caused them? Let me interrupt. What caused that shift? They, when they were growing, yeah. they were great. They got but when they big. got. Mm -hmm. Exactly. They got what happens big. is, Trisha, I'll tell you something. What happens is a guy will come in. Okay, I'll tell you what happened exactly in another company similar to Cognizant because I have a very good understanding of the company. I know the people inside out. The guy comes into the head of talent, uh, talent in the team, and he ensures that no vendors, like how you guys were working, vendors make any money. He just tells them to start getting resumes by promising placements with them. And so what, where... what happened? This happened in another company, a similar company to Cognizant. Okay, what happens is uh, they, a, a guy in TA will come, a, a, a big guy in the company will want to show his ability to increase the revenue of the company by cutting out external costs. Okay, okay what's so your what point? Saying? What's your point? So what they do is they implement a very smooth system where they just try to harvest resumes from various terms. Okay, uh, well, you said that already. Yeah, but this is done in a very smooth way. Now, for example, in Trisha's case, it was CTS, okay? It was initially growing. When they were growing, they had someone else under them. Oh, so now they've, got a, now they've got now enough they people in their database. Got, yeah, that's what they're doing. Maybe that's what happened. Maybe not. Okay. Let me move on to uh, this other issue. The question is, will I get paid? Okay. This guy, he says, I've got a great candidate. I just got off the phone with her. She mentioned at the end of the call that she's heard about my client because her boss, her old boss just started working there. But the boss didn't contact her. Actually, he, he took a job there. He hadn't started yet. So she hadn't talked to the boss, but she knew about it. And he hadn't talked to her. Okay. Now, he says sooner or later, he says this company's going to start asking this new employee if there's other people he can bring in. So he's worried if he's going to get if he's going to get paid for bringing in the subordinate of the team of, of their new new hire. Gavin, what do you think? Well, I place contractors mostly in any case, so I never have that kind of issue. What? 
I place contractors mostly. Oh, so I don't okay. So you don't want to issue. comment. You don't want to comment. Is that what you're saying? I don't know. Okay. Is that what I you're saying? I don't have enough experience. Yes, you do. Okay. Trisha, do you want to comment on that? Um, give me the question again. This guy, this guy talked to his. Oh, is he going to get paid? Yeah. Do you know what? Likely he is going to be paid because the manager that was already moved over, there's a high probability that that manager has a non solicitation clause in their previous employment contract. Yeah. The third party recruiter would have to be used. I'd tell that person submit that candidate as soon as possible, and there's a high likelihood they'd be paid. Okay, but these yeah. companies are almost finding any excuse to get out of paying. Oh, we talked to her a year ago, okay? So, the, what, I, like, my, my, my guess is that they would tell the recruiter, hey, you know what, next week we were gonna talk to her boss and we would have got the, that name ourselves. We don't have to pay you, okay? That's my take. I think that's he's gonna- that's procuring cause. We didn't get to it in time and you already talked to the candidate. Like, the mm -hmm. recruiter that's asking the question would be the procuring cause because no one else talk to this candidate yeah, about the okay. job. I like that term, procuring cause, okay? But a company that doesn't want to pay a fee doesn't give a hoot about that stuff. It's in his contract, okay? But he might have to take them to court. That's my opinion. Mario, do you want to say something? Do, yeah, take them to court, suck the living blood out of them. Okay, but what Similar do you think? Do you think he's going to have hey, a problem? He, he, he should not have a problem. Okay. You think the manager is going to go back to the company and say, hey, I've got a nice company. You want to come work for them? They don't want to go back to their old colleagues. As Trisha said beautifully, there is going to be a non-confidential uh, day, whatever, uh, non-solicitation non clause, right? For yeah. sure it's there. I gotta, gonna I, I, I gotta t find somebody to teach you to get a good sound. The echo is driving me my crazy. My office is horrible. My office and you didn't have it last week when you called in yeah, from your home. I was in my house calling from my house. What do you think? Okay, last issue. I think this is the last issue. <laughs> and, and Gavin's gonna say, well, I'm not a corporate recruiter, so I can't comment on this. And that's fair. None of us here are corporate recruiters, but I just found this one interesting. This uh, sorcerer, who was working as part of a, a recruiting team, uh, she came in on a, a search that was already going, okay? And she found out okay. that the, the hiring process is five interviews and a five hour assessment for some kind of technical role. She said one candidate did the five hour assessment, but she just answered the questions and didn't uh, show her work. So the hiring manager wants to interview her again. I think that must be like taking a test in school and you come up with the answer, but you didn't show the teacher how you got it. I, I'm not sure, maybe someone can tell me. Okay, so she said, I asked him if he would be comfortable making an offer without the additional interview. And he went nuts and started shouting and talking over me. I tried calmly telling him that we were there to advise him, but he was shouting uh, that he's always done it this way and he's gonna escalate this conflict to the people above him. And the recruiter that she was working with, the source of, the recruiter is only 24 years old and she, she started crying. <laughs> She's sorry. She started crying. I've never heard of anything like this. And she said the call concluded with him asking if we have any additional candidates and we didn't. He said he wasn't surprised and that he's going to use an agency in the future. And she asks, how can... How can I fix this relationship? Anybody want to comment on that? I found it quite amusing. Anybody? You know what, Animal? This is exactly what we were talking about earlier about persuading your hand, your, your and fighting for your, uh, you know, the, the industry and the job of a recruiter vis-a-vis -a, -vis a hiring manager. That person's a complete and utter twat. What I would say I is I that. would organize five different meetings in a location one hour away, spread over three weeks, and see if that hiring managers willing to go and make oh, that effort of going God. down to these interviews. Oh, people like that annoy me so much. It's crazy. That's actually, a client I'd fire. I actually feel <laughs> animal. I actually feel sorry for that girl. The recruiter who started crying. They're never yeah. going to lambast to their life, I think. Because so the guy is sort of the yelling. Basis. <laughs> yeah. Very bad management. Job. Trisha, would yeah, you fire true. him or would you try to do something? Oh, I would. Oh, you're, fire well, you're him. external. I mean, she's internal. Know. She can't fire him. What would you if do? I you was have an internal, 
If I was yeah. an internal employee and that happened to me, man, I would be out of there so fast. I uh -huh. would be looking for uh, another actually, job. Uh, That's a hostile work environment. I wouldn't do it. No, actually, Trisha, I think that, that the, the recruiter could have raised a complaint against him for abuse. Yeah, I he think was so just abuse. that he can do that. Huh? I think she can do that, for sure. Okay, uh, maybe. That's That's goal set. Yeah. That's anybody issue, yes. anybody yeah. here got an issue? I've been giving all the issues. Anything that you, you guys, the trainers here, that you think is very important that you'd like to share with the recruiting world? No? Okay. That's okay with me. Uh, let me see if I'll I can. I'll tell you what, because you're going you're gonna to find there's a, there's a message from me, uh, Animal, but you can ignore it. I, may, I put a post in, in the group about uh, the billing levels. Yeah. And I've deleted it because apparently everybody could see the results. So that was definitely not the aim. But I read a post about three weeks ago where somebody said that 2% of recruiters bring in 100,000, okay, this is in pounds sterling, but 100,000 a year as a salary. So that's salary plus commission. So if you're calculating that you take home maybe a third of, the, of your billings, in Europe at least it's a third, in the, in the US it's more, that means that only 2% of agency recruiters are billing 300,000. And that 2%, that seems absolutely crazy, crazy low for me. So that's wow. something that I would like to have more data on. Okay, I, I have no, nothing for you. I don't know if anybody else here wants to contribute to, to that comment. I mean, I'll contribute to it. I certainly, Gavin, think that that's an absurd number. Now, I have a coaching client that is uh, from the UK. He's actually in Mexico now, but he's been in the, spent most of his uh, career in the UK. And um, we've talked at length about the differences between recruiting in the UK and the recruiting in the United States. And I think those numbers jive with what he's told me about UK-based recruiting that uh, – 40,000 pounds, 50,000 pounds is what an average recruiter makes in the UK. Um, but here in the States, that is not the case. I mean, I, I know that we have a lot of recruiters, but boy, it has to be more than 2% that are billing 300,000. Because I mean, I know a lot of recruiters and I know a lot of recruiters that bill over 300,000, and I'm quite certain it's more than 2%. So I wouldn't I wouldn't trust the validity of those numbers on a global scale. Hmm. I'd love to have the real data, but I, I, I'm with you. I'm with you on that, definitely. Even though you were talking about 30, 40, 50,000 quid, even that seems low. But no jargon, no foreign words. Oh, I better watch myself. Don't say that. No foreign words, okay? Hey, but we don't know what quid means, okay? What's that? Oh, pounds? Uh, pounds? 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 Sorry. Pounds. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Okay. Well, now I've got some follow-up questions, but the show's almost over. I'm not going to get involved. I'm going to thank everybody for coming. I had a lot of fun. Okay. Gavin, everything about recruiting.com. He's a trainer as well with his dot com. What? Everything about recruitment.com. Oh, I forgot. Yeah, he's over there. Talk about foreign. Okay. Everything about recruitment.com. Check him out. He's a trainer with his own, I must say, his own unique take on things. The famous Trisha Tampkin, I met Trisha and her husband. Uh, I think she looks different now. When I saw her, she would have been uh, perfect standing uh, at the stage uh, with the Sex Pistols. <laughs> okay, she looked like a punk. I'll take uh, that for the compliment it is. <laughs> yeah, I, thought, I thought it was interesting. And the great MarioTheRecruiter.com who's got bad sound. Thanks, everybody. It was great. I really enjoyed it. Okay. Bye.